Uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Dean and Chapter to St Margaret's Church, Westminster Abbey, for this lecture as part of your 700th anniversary of the foundation of Exeter College in Oxford. Uh, my name is Andrew Tremlett. I'm the Rector of St Margaret's Church uh, and Sub-Dean of Westminster Abbey. Uh, just a few words about where we are this evening for this uh, marvellous opportunity and occasion. Uh, you may wonder why there's a small, modest church stuck right next to Westminster Abbey. Well, the simple answer is that in 1066, when the Abbey was founded next door, or the second version of the Abbey was founded next door, the monks decided that they needed a small parish church so that they weren't bothered too much. That's the foundation for St. Margaret's, uh, and it's been here ever since, uh, nearly a thousand years, 950 years, uh, serving people within the local community, and our parish in, uh, today uh, simply includes a small site next door, the Palace of Westminster. What you have here in front of you is the 1523 version of St. Margaret's, the Tudor version, uh, although slightly altered uh, later over the years. Uh, the east window that you may like to take a look at later on is the engagement window of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, so it's worth uh, a closer look. In 1614, members of the House of Commons decided that they'd had too much of the, uh, the flummery next door in the Abbey and decided they wanted something a little more sedate and Protestant and on Palm Sunday came and said their prayers in here. That was the origins of the prayers being said at the start of sessions of Parliament and in time of uh, due course, they then had their prayers said by their chaplain, now the Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, uh, over in the chamber of the House of Commons. However, we still very much keep a link with the Commons. Many of the formal occasions of the House of Commons and of the House of Lords happen in here, whether it's weddings or baptisms or memorial services, parliamentary carol services, and of course the service to mark the start of the new parliament will happen in here in a couple of weeks' time. Sir Walter Raleigh is buried under the high altar. Winston Churchill was married in here and led the House of Commons in here to pray on VE Day. It's a particular delight for me to be welcoming you as members of Exeter College, uh, simply because I'm Devonian myself by birth. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome others who have that connection, including, of course, your visitor, the Bishop of Exeter, who's here this evening. I should also say that uh, your chapel, uh, which I think was built by Gilbert Scott, was modeled on Sainte Chapelle in Paris as was St. Stephen's Chapel, much older, in the Palace of Westminster. It was there to which the members of the House of Commons uh, moved after they'd been meeting for 300 years in Westminster Abbey, mostly in the Chapter House. They had been meeting, of course, in an octagonal space, so most likely in the round. They then moved to St. Stephen's Chapel, where, of course, it was set out like we have here with the choir stalls facing one another, and that's where you get the arrangement for current Parliament. And uh, it's good to ponder on whether if they'd stayed in the Abbey, they might, might have been more collegiate rather than having the, uh, the forceful dialogue that you get by facing one another. But Lord Tyler will be able to say more about that. So now to introduce your very distinguished speaker, your rector this evening, Sir Rick Trainer, who indeed is no stranger to Westminster Abbey. Rick served as principal of King's College London from 2004 to 2014. Of course, before then, he was vice chancellor to uh, the University of Greenwich and uh, also in uh, Glasgow. Born in the United States, Sir Rick was educated in Maryland and graduated from Brown University uh, in American Civilization. He subsequently earned his MAs from Princetown and from Merton College, Oxford. So no hissing, please. Before he earned his DPhil at Nuffield College, entitled Authority and Social Structure in an Industrialized Area, a Study of Three Black Country Towns, 
1840 to 1890. He is, of course, a former Rhodes Scholar. Rick is a member of the Academy of Learned Societies for the Social Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He's also an honorary fellow of Merton College, Oxford, and Trinity College of Music, and a member of the Anglo-American Fulbright Commission. I'm told that he was awarded an honorary knighthood in June 2010, but having taken British nationality, we're now allowed to call him formally Sir Rick Trainer. His lecture this evening could not be more timely. On Tuesday evening, uh, we welcomed as part of the Institute for the Abbey, which I chair, all of the new MPs were invited. About two thirds came, including most of the SNP members for uh, a time in the Abbey. So the title of uh, Rick's lecture, What Has Held the UK Together and What Might It Keep It United in the Future? A Historian's Perspective. Please would you welcome Sir Rick Trainer. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's quite something for one rector to introduce another. So, um... My lords, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be giving this lecture, particularly to a largely alumni audience during the first year of my rectorship at Exeter. A 700th anniversary is a great event. Only a small proportion of institutions have lasted for seven centuries. And the very welcome presence this evening of the college's visitor, the Bishop of Exeter, reminds us of the college's West Country origins and continuing links. Also, Exeter College Oxford has achieved a great deal since the early 14th century. Not least, it has adapted to the massive changes around it. For example, in the relationship of England with Scotland, the focal point of this evening's lecture. It's also a great pleasure to be speaking in this beautiful and historic parliamentary church. We're indebted to the Dean and Chapter of Westminster, in particular to Canon Andrew Tremlett, the Rector, and to Exeter alumnus Lord Tyler, also present, who has served as our intermediary. Our location is highly appropriate, as Andrew Tremlett's already pointed out, for today's lecture, because of Parliament's key role in the history of the English-Scottish Union. And in the spirit of this age, I think I should warn you that this occasion is being recorded. A bit like Parliament in that respect. In this lecture, I'm attempting to bring to bear 40 years of reflection as a historian of modern Britain on a key issue of the early 21st century, the future of the United Kingdom. However, in doing so, I'm not implying that I've specialized on this question or have done original research directly on it. Indeed, this evening, I'll be drawing substantially on the work of historians who have concentrated on these issues especially Linda Colley, Tom Devine, Alvin Jackson, Colin Kidd, James Mitchell, Keith Robbins, and Christopher Watley. But this lecture does offer my own perspective. And in forming it, I'm drawing directly on my own research on the elites, especially the urban and university elites of 19th and 20th century Britain, including case studies of the English West Midlands and of West Central Scotland. I should also acknowledge possible sources of bias. My American origins have influenced my perspective. After all, my native country expended hundreds of thousands of lives in the 1860s, establishing, among other important principles, that the geographical unity of the country was no longer an issue for legitimate debate. Also, I'm descended from people in many parts of these islands, including England, Wales, and Ireland, where my maternal grandmother was born in the late 19th century. Most importantly for this lecture, I worked for 21 years in Scotland, where my children, Richard and Meg, present here this evening, were born, during a period which saw the emergence of the Scottish Parliament. And my wife, Marguerite Dupree, also here today, 
while now spending much of her time at Exeter, has had a strong academic affiliation to Glasgow for the last 29 years. But of course, the task of a historian is to overcome any personal biases, to explain rather than to take sides. So this lecture is not an argument either for or against the union between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Speaking this week in a venue next to the meeting place of the House of Commons, for once it's not necessary for a historian to make an elaborate argument for the relevance of his topic. During the last eight days, a political hurricane has destroyed the long-established labor domination of Scottish representation at Westminster. This ferocious storm has also destroyed an even more deep-seated pattern, whereby the great bulk of Scottish seats in the Westminster Parliament have been held by parties organized on a UK basis and committed to the preservation of the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, against all predictions, the Conservatives have done well enough in England and Wales to obtain an absolute majority of seats in the UK Parliament. So a determinedly unionist party, which emphasized during its recent campaign the undesirability of SNP influence on UK government, faces a separatist party which portrays the Conservatives as especially hostile to Scottish interests. In recent days, including apparently today when David Cameron met Nicola Sturgeon in Edinburgh, both the Conservatives and the SNP have been more conciliatory than militant. But there are bound to be serious rifts between the SNP and the Conservative government during the new parliament. Also, there will be a Scottish parliamentary election in 2016 with the possibility of an SNP manifesto committed to a second referendum on independence. The prospect of a UK referendum on the European Union also aggravates tensions given the SNP's strong commitment to Europe. Meanwhile, English and Welsh voters who had thought that last September's referendum settled the issue of independence, quote, for a generation, unquote, may reduce pressure on their MPs to preserve the link with Scotland. Thus, the union with Scotland appears to be in great peril. To find a parallel, one has to go back to the leverage exercised by Irish nationalist MPs after the two general elections of 1910. And that's not a happy precedent for the union with Scotland, as the indirect result then was the breakup of the Union with Ireland in 1922. Indeed, the events of last week might seem to have made redundant the subject of this lecture, with its emphasis on what has held the Union together until now and might do so in the future. You won't be surprised to hear that I don't see it that way. Though I admit that the mood music on these issues has changed key since I set the topic a couple of months ago. Actually, I think that last week's election makes this evening's topic even more important. In order to understand the current crisis of the Union, we need to consider its underlying strengths and weaknesses over the long term. So my task in this lecture is to try to establish how far the history of the UK can help us to understand these tumultuous recent events and far more speculatively to anticipate what might happen in the future. In doing so, I need to cast my net widely, though necessarily in each case leaving it in the water for only a short time. I'll deal with Wales and Ireland as well as Scotland, and even more importantly, cover monarchical, imperial, military, economic, social, and cultural factors, as well as narrowly political issues. I'll start by examining the long-term success of the Union with Scotland. Then, informed by the Irish example, I'll go on to analyze the weaknesses, some of them of distant origin, which, greatly exacerbated by the events of the last few years, have now put the Union in acute danger. Finally, I'll look briefly at regional issues within England and cross-cutting uh, factors between the boundaries of England, Scotland, and Wales. They may provide clues to future developments, 
which might yet keep Scotland and England closely connected, even if not necessarily as part of a single nation state. Let's begin by analyzing the longevity of the union with Scotland and the many forces which have sustained it. The immediate origins of the Anglo-Scottish Union of 1707 were less than edifying. Political maneuvering in the wake of the disastrous Scottish speculation on the Darien scheme in Central America led to Scots politicians agreeing to wind up their own parliament. Yet there had been a union of crowns between Scotland and England since 1603. And as Colin Kidd has pointed out, the Union had its roots in long-term Scottish thinking, as well as in short-term tactics. Also, there was considerable support in Scotland, fueled by strong Protestant sentiment, for the Glorious Revolution, which in 1689 drove out the Catholic King James II and installed the Protestant William and Mary. The Union, like the monarchy, which of course became Hanoverian from 1714, was for these many Scots a bulwark against Jacobitism, the rebellious attempt to restore the Catholic Stuarts to the throne. Suppression of Jacobite risings in 1715 and 1745 helped to tie the mainly Protestant population of Scotland, particularly in the lowlands, firmly to the Union. The University of Glasgow, my old institution, went so far as to award the Duke of Cumberland, the so-called Butcher of Culloden, an honorary degree after he helped put down the 1745 rebellion. Shared Protestantism, language, and a special British sense of liberty combined, as Linda Colley has observed, to help link the kingdoms together. Scottish acceptance of the union with England also benefited from the protections for Scottish institutions, which in effect were guaranteed by the union. Crucially, Scotland retained its newly reestablished Presbyterian church. Scotland also secured its legal system based on Roman rather than common law. Education too remained separate, crowned by Scotland's four universities at a time when England had only two. In addition, Scotland soon developed its special place in 18th century British government with a trusted manager serving as a conduit for Scottish patronage. Gradually, Scottish allegiance to the Union became broader and firmer, as indicated by George IV's well-received visit to Edinburgh in 1822. The king wore the kilt, by then a token of Scottish cultural and political rapprochement with England, rather than, as it had been in the 18th century, a symbol of Highland Rebellion. These ties were strengthened by Queen Victoria's purchase of Balmoral and her frequent visits there, during which she attended the Church of Scotland rather than the Scottish Episcopal Church. So too, as Tom Devine has demonstrated, did the Scots disproportionate share in the ever larger British Empire as administrators, missionaries, and business people, as well as ordinary emigrants. Similarly, organized into Scottish regiments, Scotsmen were disproportionately represented in the British Army as early as the late 18th century. So the Scots had strong material and emotional stakes in the emergence of Britain as a strong imperial and military power during the late 18th century, the 19th century, and the early years of the 20th. Such strong Scottish identification with the British military and state laid the basis for the major Scottish role in British war efforts. During the First World War, Scotland suffered disproportionate casualties. And during the Second World War, Scottish towns such as Clyde Bank suffered bombing as bad as any English city. During these wars, and even during the severe economic slump in Scotland in the 1920s, immediately after the First World War, many Scots emigrated to other parts of the empire, but very few agitated for Scottish independence. 
The vast majority of Scots people evidently saw their interests closely tied to those of the English and the Welsh. Right down to 1945 and beyond, Scotland was seen by the vast majority of people, internally as well as in England and Wales, as an integral part of the UK. Indeed, there had emerged during the 19th century, as Keith Robbins has argued, a British identity, which affected Scotland as well as England and Wales. This is not to suggest that England, Wales, and Scotland ceased to matter to their respective peoples. Nor is it to suggest that British feelings overwhelmed concern with separate Scottish, Welsh, and Irish interests. But a sense of being British also mattered, particularly at moments of national crisis, such as the struggles against Napoleon and Hitler. In peace as well as war, Scots evidently did not have to choose between their firm sense of Scottish identity, as symbolized by monuments to Walter Scott and dinners in memory of Robert Burns, and their identity as Britons and citizens of the United Kingdom, as embodied in Scottish monuments to Nelson, Wellington, and the Boer War hero, Lord Roberts. This dual identity becomes more comprehensible when we take into account that monarchical, imperial, and military integration was complemented by economic and social integration. By the late 18th century, Scotland had an advanced industrial and commercial sector, closely linked with the advanced parts of the English and Welsh economies. Likewise, once large corporations became commonplace in the later 19th century, these firms often straddled the boundary between Scotland and England. In the interim, the railways, the telegraph, and later the telephone created a much needed and efficient British communication system. The benefits of this extended economic network were unevenly distributed, both among the kingdoms and within them. Ireland clearly profited least, though Ulster was a prosperous region even in UK terms, and England profited most. Especially at first, for many in the population, in Scotland perhaps even more than in England and Wales, there was much misery, urban as well as rural, in Glasgow slums as in Highland Crofts. Yet the majority of the population in all three British countries gained from the mid-19th century from the sustained long-term growth of the economy. This overall advance continued despite significant slowdowns during recessions right through to our own time. Now, this is not to argue that the Union caused the bulk of this advance, though on balance, the Union almost certainly contributed to it by broadening the scale of the UK's internal market. Viewed over the long term, the Union with Scotland has at least been compatible with massive gains in living standards, which have made the UK one of the world's most prosperous countries. Participation in prosperity, then, as in military victories and imperial expansion, has been a major glue holding the Union together. The social groups which profited most from economic advance were, of course, the upper class of aristocracy and gentry, and the upper echelons of a broadly defined middle class. These groups also participated most intensively in the social, cultural, and political aspects of the Scottish-English Union. Famously, the upper class increasingly used intermarriage and English public schools, supplemented by attendance at Oxford and Cambridge colleges, to forge a unified lifestyle. It focused on the London season, but also drew many posh English as well as Scottish people across the border for substantial parts of the year, starting with the so-called Glorious Twelfth. Much the same can be said of the numerous upper middle class. Scottish business and professional people became very well integrated with their English counterparts during the 19th century. The elites of Scottish cities, such as Glasgow, followed a similar path to those in major provincial English conurbations, 
such as Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds. Men such as the Clydeside shipbuilder John Denny use local prominence to become major intermediaries with London, winning concessions there for their home regions. North as well as south of the border, urban elites use political and social as well as economic muscle, making the playing field with London and the southeast less steeply sloped than it would otherwise have been. Meanwhile, the devolved institutions of Scotland strengthened the Union by providing Scottish leaders with ties to the world beyond their kingdom. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Kirk, had its Lord High Commissioner appointed by the Sovereign, who resided during the Assembly's annual meetings in the Royal Palace of Holy Root House in Edinburgh. The Scottish judiciary at its highest levels was linked to London, and Scottish professional bodies were affiliated to UK counterparts. Scottish university students regularly elected prominent English politicians to their symbolic office of rector. Also from the early 20th century, those Scottish universities became more tightly drawn into broader academic networks. In addition, Scotland under the Union became a stepping stone to broader roles in the United Kingdom as a whole. Prominent examples include Douglas Haig, commander of the British Army in the First World War, Donald McAllister, president of the General Medical Council and principal of Glasgow University, and the highly influential civil servant Sir Alec Cairncross, the late father of my predecessor, Francis, who is here with us today. In culture, too, popular entertainers often had fame which crossed the border, while the Edinburgh Festival achieved an iconic status throughout the whole UK and beyond. At a more humble level, substantial numbers of English and Scottish people moved across the border, notably when Scottish farming families and industrial workers flocked to the East Midlands and East Anglia, respectively, between the two world wars. Alongside this economic, social, professional, and personal integration was a set of political institutions which coalesced into what James Kellis has convincingly characterized as a Scottish political system. Even the monarch had a special Scottish role, taking up residence annually at Holyrood House and holding well-publicized parties and honors ceremonies there. Of more practical importance, Substantial elements of administrative devolution emerged long before the political devolution of 1999. In addition to powerful municipal councils from the 1830s, there was a Secretary for Scotland from 1885 and a number of Scottish supervisory boards. From the 1930s, much administrative supervision occurred in Edinburgh rather than London. During the Second World War, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Tom Johnston, had considerable autonomy and won from London central government investment in Scottish hydroelectric projects, for example. Then, after 1945, the rise of the so-called welfare state, with provisions applying equally across the Scottish-English border, further consolidated the Union, as Alvin Jackson has emphasized. The National Health Service, widespread unemployment benefits, extensive council house building, aid to ailing industries, and widespread nationalization, such measures helped to produce a net transfer of UK public spending north of the border through financial mechanisms such as the Barnett formula and through lobbying by the Scottish office. Moreover, as early as the 1860s, the Westminster Parliament served as a major force integrating Scotland with the rest of the United Kingdom. In the presence of Paul Tyler, who served in both Houses of Parliament, I note that after the Union, representatives of Scottish peers participated actively in the House of Lords. In the Commons, prominent English politicians sometimes sat for Scottish seats, notably Herbert Asquith in Paisley, Winston Churchill in Dundee, and Roy Jenkins in Glasgow. More significantly, many prominent Scots served at Westminster and had major impact there. Among them were six prime ministers, 
Arthur Balfour, Henry Campbell Bannerman, Andrew Boner Law, Ramsey MacDonald, Alec Douglas Hume, and Gordon Brown. As some of these names indicate, Westminster was a key focus of political ambition on the left as well as the right of Scottish politics. The Scotsman James Keir Hardie, for example, founded the Labour Party and was its first MP. And the importance of the House of Commons to Scots was symbolized by the large crowds at Glasgow St. Enoch Station in 1922, who watched the Red Clydesiders leave to take up their seats at Westminster. Less spectacularly, once constituency presence and service became the norm in the 20th century, virtually all Scottish MPs link their home localities to London. This political integration was significantly facilitated by a pattern whereby for most of the period up until 1979, there were only brief interludes when the government of the UK was run by a party with little support in Scotland. During most of the 19th century, the Liberal Party flourished both in Scotland and at Westminster. The subsequent split in liberalism from the 1880s over liberal proposals for Irish home rule did not seriously disturb the union with Scotland. Protestant sympathies among many voting Scots made the Unionist Party, as Scotland's liberal unionists and conservatives named their combined new party, highly electorally viable. This proved true even during the UK conservative ascendancy of the 1950s. The unions captured fully 50% of the Scottish vote in the general election of 1955. Thus, the union with Scotland for more than two and a half centuries was a multifaceted success. Military, imperial, economic, social, cultural, and political. This generalization gains added force when that union is compared to the British Union with Ireland, which prevailed between 1801 and 1922. Undermined as it was by King George III's refusal to accept the mild version of Catholic emancipation originally proposed, the union with Ireland never shook off the association with the Irish Protestant ascendancy with which it began. Daniel O'Connell's subsequent Catholic emancipation helped. However, even the wide-ranging measures of Gladstone's liberal governments disestablishing the Protestant Church of Ireland, enacting substantial land reforms, proposing Irish home rule, these measures failed to help head off the growth of Irish nationalism. Now, as usual, inevitability is difficult to demonstrate. Without die-hard resistance to Irish home rule from the Protestant majority in Ulster, and without the First World War, Irish home rule within a broader United Kingdom might have prevailed. But when the union with Ireland did fail in the 1920s, it was easy to detect the deep flaws inherent in the original arrangements. If the union with Scotland was, as I have argued, so strong for so long, how could it have become so apparently weak in our own time? In many ways, this paradox is a false one. After all, the union does still exist and was reaffirmed in a Scottish referendum only nine months ago, in part because of the many long-term strengths I've already described. Still, the Union is now much weaker than it was in the mid-20th century, so there is change to explain. Part of the answer lies in long-term problems of the Union with Scotland, lurking beneath its overall success down to the 1970s. In this respect, there's more of an analogy, if still a very inexact one, with the failed Irish Union than with the ongoing union with Wales. Now, I realize I must be careful in mentioning Wales, if only out of respect for the memory of my Welsh ancestor who emigrated to the colony of Maryland in the 1680s. Future events may show, particularly if Scotland does separate from the UK, that the union of Wales, with Wales becomes another great UK crisis. But Wales is a much smaller country in both population and area than Scotland. 
and one whose administration was simply absorbed into England and as early as the 1500s. Also, despite the revival of Welsh identity in the 19th and 20th centuries, the Welsh language emphasis of Welsh nationalism has limited its appeal in Wales as a whole. The more secure integration of Wales with England is indicated by the weaker powers of the Welsh Assembly compared with those of the Scottish Parliament. Now, I think that the analogy between Scotland and Ireland, paradoxically, is more instructive about the long-term underlying vulnerability of the Scottish Union. For the Union of 1707, while wisely tolerating distinctive Scottish institutions, far more than did its Irish equivalent, also allowed the sense of Scottish identity associated with those institutions to persist. Thus, as in the Irish case, though less contentiously for a very long time, the English-Scottish Union has had to manage difficulties inherent in the Scottish sense of being a people different from the English, a feeling always in competition with the more recent British identity that I mentioned earlier. Such feelings do much to explain the recurrent particular problems that have had to be resolved throughout the life of the Union, as emphasized by James Mitchell. The perceived need to appease the Scottish sense of having legitimate special interests lay behind early devolved arrangements, such as the establishment of the Scottish office and the enactment of separate legislation for Scotland. In a real sense, the Scottish-English Union has depended, even during long periods of apparent quiescence about the Union, notably during the 19th century with its fashion for the term North Britain, on the willingness of the Scots to have their separate identity coexist with a sovereign British state. This persisted, persisting Scottish national feeling, evident in the 20th century and beyond in fierce Scottish support for national teams, and of course Scottish support for any country playing against England, did not preordain the current greater danger for the Union. But such feelings have meant that a prolonged crisis regarding the Union could lead to political separation. And such a crisis became more probable in the final third of the 20th century, as Scotland became more conscious of its industrial weakness, as the role of the empire and the military contracted, as political Protestantism faded, and as the end of the Cold War and the umbrella of the European Union made a small independent nation seem more viable. I think this is the context in which we should evaluate the rise during the last 30 years, and especially the, the last five, in backing for the Scottish National Party. Although there had been some support for modest measures of Scottish home rule in the late 19th century and after, the separatist SNP was not founded until the interwar years. And the SNP didn't win its first parliamentary seat until a by-election in 1967. But the coming on stream of North Sea oil in the 1970s, apparently making independence for the first time economically plausible, laid the basis for an SNP political breakthrough in the election of October 1974. In that election, the SNP secured 30% of the Scottish vote and 11 of the 79 Scottish seats. This led to the 1978 referendum on Scottish devolution. It failed, despite approval by the majority of those voting, because of a much resented proviso imposed by Westminster requiring a yes vote by 40% of the whole electorate. That impasse helped to bring down Jim Callaghan's Labour government in 1979. When, in the ensuing general election of that year, the SNP won only 17% of the Scottish vote and gained only two seats at Westminster, the momentum for separatism seemed to have been lost. But during the 18 years of the Thatcher and Major governments, the first prolonged period when Scottish and English political preferences were markedly different, resentment at rule from London spread across much of the Scottish electorate. 
Many Scots who since the 1960s had regularly voted for mainly Labour MPs blamed the Conservative government in London for the sharp further erosion of their manufacturing base. The implementation of the poll tax in Scotland ahead of its implementation in the rest of the UK was also hugely unpopular. So it was highly predictable once Labour returned to power at Westminster in 1997, with very strong support in Scotland, that there would be an easy yes victory in a further devolution referendum and the early establishment of a Scottish Parliament and Scottish government with wide powers. Now, as we know, the Holyrood Parliament in Edinburgh has proven to be a happy hunting ground for the SNP. Yet before rushing to conclude that independence is now inevitable, it's important to recall that the SNP's rise within the Holyrood system did not happen immediately, and that the subsequent groundswell of SNP support in Holyrood elections has taken even longer to impinge on Westminster contests. Indeed, in the 2010 Westminster election, the SNP secured only six of Scotland's 59 seats. Similarly, in each of the first two Holyrood elections, the SNP gained less than 30% of the vote. The Scottish government, it's important to remember, was run until 2007, not by the SNP, but by a Labour Lib Dem coalition. It was only in the 2007 Holyrood elections that the SNP first gained a mere plurality of votes and seats, leading to an SNP minority government at Holyrood. 2011 was the watershed, as the SNP secured 45% of the vote and just over half of the seats in that year's Holyrood election, enough to produce an SNP majority government, despite Holyrood's version of proportional representation. These SNP governments were widely praised for their competence, and they increasingly stole Scottish Labour's left-wing credentials. The SNP later produced with crucial acquiescence from the coalition government at Westminster, the independence referendum of September 2014 with its 45% yes vote. David Cameron then defiantly revived on the very morning of the referendum result, the issue of quote, English votes for English questions, unquote. By doing so, he threw into doubt the so-called solemn vow that the UK party leaders had made to Scots during the referendum campaign. Among other factors, this apparent rebuff to Scotland translated into a huge rise in SNP membership and the SNP's remarkable showing last Thursday. Fully 50% of the Scottish vote, and thanks to the first-past-the-post system still prevailing in elections to the Westminster Parliament, 56 of the 59 Scottish parliamentary seats. Does the rise of the SNP in recent decades, greatly compounded by its further rise in the last few years, mean that the end of the union between Scotland and England during the next few years is inevitable? Well, almost anything is possible in democratic politics, so it would be unwise to predict, and especially for a historian like me to do so. But we can safely say that the Union of 1707, as substantially altered in 1999, is currently at its lowest ebb ever. Some of the factors which have propelled the SNP's recent further rise, for example, the shortage of grassroots Scottish labor activists, are at least in theory reversible. But what will be harder to reverse is the transformation of the SNP in the last four years and especially in the last 12 months, into what former Scottish Labour First Minister Henry McLeish last week called a movement and a cause. As former Scottish Labour leader Wendy Alexander pointed out in an Exeter College seminar last term, the increasing tendency of Scots to link SNP support with Scottish identity has been fueled by SNP advertising which connects the party with general hopes for improvement and with specific hopes for leverage at Westminster. Moreover, 
in marked contrast to the so-called tartan Toryism of the SNP in its early years. The current party has strong appeal across boundaries of region, class, and religion, notably in Dundee and Glasgow, with their substantial Catholic populations. Those formerly solidly labor cities, which voted yes in last September's referendum, last week sent SNP members to the Westminster Parliament with huge majorities on record-setting swings against labor of up to 39%. Of course, no party is immortal. Eventually, the SNP will lose its status as a repository of the national aspirations of a large percentage of the Scottish electorate. But this inevitable ultimate decline might come in the form of a split only after independence has been implemented. If the Scottish English Union does dissolve during the next few years, will this show that it was fatally flawed from the outset? In my interpretation, the long-term problems besetting the Union, particularly those associated with an abiding strong sense of Scottishness, certainly help to explain why there was a basis for the recent spectacular rise of Scottish political separatism. But these problems, which took a very long time to become acute after 1707, do not prove that the current state of affairs was inevitable, especially given the many long-term and persisting strengths of the Union. For example, had Scotsman Gordon Brown called and won a UK general election in 2007, thereby at least delaying the coalition government, in opposition to which the SNP made so much political capital, the state of Scottish politics might be very different now. Likewise, there are many political scenarios for the next few years which may still avoid Scottish independence. After all, 50% of the Scottish electorate declined to support the SNP last Thursday, even though the Scottish nationalists were not campaigning for a second referendum. For example, a federal solution, wide-ranging enough to involve England, might work, though it would be both complex and contentious. But short-term politics matter even in the fate of long-standing institutions. So if separation is still to be prevented, English politicians will need to show that they understand the long-standing Scottish sense of being different, which has been sharpened in recent decades and especially during the last four years. So to sum up by adopting a medical analogy, the agent patient of the Scottish Union, though acutely ill with long-term maladies, much worsened by recent serious illness, is not yet doomed, but will require his doctor to have more ingenious remedies and a much improved bedside matter if the patient is to survive. Even if Scottish independence does come during the next five to ten years, the resulting political separation is very unlikely to lead to a complete divorce between Scotland and England. There are too many children of this marriage to be considered for that to happen. I think particularly of the large number of people who see themselves as English or Welsh who live north of the border, and the large number of self-perceived Scots who live south of it. This prediction of continued contacts is not an argument for Scottish independence. Such a step may or may not be highly undesirable, both for Scotland and for the rest of the United Kingdom, for a whole host of military, economic, and political reasons. But if an independent Scotland and the rump of the UK were to continue to be fellow members of the European Union, there would be great opportunities for the movement of people, ideas, and business between England and Scotland. So the deep-seated patterns which have underpinned the Union for 300 years indicate why even its sudden end would not necessarily consign all of its inter-country connections to oblivion. Indeed, a new, very demanding phase of adapting connections between the two countries would ensue, in the wake of Scottish independence. Almost certainly, one of these successful inventions would be mechanisms enabling Scottish students, like those who spoke at this year's Exeter Burns Supper in Hull, to continue to enroll at Exeter 
at other Oxford colleges and at other English and Welsh universities. Before closing, I'd like to refer to regional issues within England. For England, the UK's largest country has serious issues of coherence quite apart from those relating to Scotland. Long-term English inequalities between North and South were reversed only partially during the Industrial Revolution period and its aftermath in the Victorian and Edwardian decades. London and the Southeast began pulling away again as they experienced economic recovery in the 1930s more thoroughly than the rest of England. Despite elaborate regional policies after the Second World War, London and its environs retained their advantages. And this lead was compounded by the meteoric rise of London and the Southeast during the past 20 years. Also, since the 1980s, there has been drastic political centralization within England. This grabbing of power by Whitehall has reduced the ability even of England's largest cities to exert the influence over their affairs that would enable them, as in the 19th century heyday of municipal leadership, to regenerate the relative prosperity of the Midlands and the North. If the union with Scotland and England survives the next few years, an acceleration of the current very recent trend to give more power to English provincial cities, as in George Osborne's announcement yesterday about Manchester, might provide the basis for civic collaboration and borrowing between cities both north and south of the border. This might help to recapture some of the interconnections and join to English-Scottish provincial dynamism of the late 19th century. When Joseph Chamberlain, for example, used his experience as rector of Glasgow University to borrow aspects of that Scottish institution for his new University of Birmingham. For Scotland, like England, has never been homogeneous in itself, quite the opposite. Scotland's cities, each with its own sophisticated press, retain considerable dynamism. Such patterns might do something to stabilize from below a reprieved United Kingdom. Whether this civic revival will occur and whether the Union will, after all, be reprieved, we shall discover early in the 8th century of Exeter College, Oxford, an exciting period which we, the Exeter College family, will officially enter after today. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Atwell, and as Bishop of Exeter, it's my privilege on behalf of us all to pay warm thanks to Sir Rick Trainer's most excellent lecture. One of the surprises on becoming Bishop of Exeter last year was to discover that I was visitor of Exeter College. And when I asked Rick and before him Francis Cairncross what that might be, I was informed that uh, well, this was largely a symbolic role, but if the rector and fellows are in a dispute which they can't sort out, then I've got to go in and try and sort it out myself. But since you're such an ironic lot, I doubt whether that will have to happen very often. The Diocese of Exeter was founded before the Norman Conquest by King Edward the Confessor, whose body, of course, lies buried next door behind the high altar in the abbey that he built. And of course, in those days, the United Kingdom didn't exist. These Atlantic Isles were four separate competing nations. And over the centuries, the Sea of Exeter has been occupied by, well, scholars such as Hugh de Oldham, who founded Manchester Grammar School, poets such as Miles Coverdale, who translated the Hebrew Psalms into Immaculate English, which is still enshrined in the prayer book and sung at Evensong in the college chapel. With cads like Bishop Philpotts, who opposed the abolition of slavery, mainly because he owned so many slaves himself, and the occasional saint. 
Unfortunately, there wasn't one available last year, so they got me. And there have also been eccentrics, such as William Cecil, who once traveling across Devon by train to conduct a confirmation, couldn't find his ticket. Don't worry, my lord, said the young ticket inspector. Everybody knows who you are. That's all very well, young man, replied Bishop Cecil, but without a ticket, how do I know where I'm going? <laughs> well, I stand before you as the 71st Bishop of Exeter. Walter de Stapledon was number 15. And sort of just saying that gives a sense of the passage of time and puts our celebrations into some sort of perspective. Stapleton was a local Devon boy made good, whose formidable intellect brought him to the attention of the king, who was keen to use his abilities at court as high treasurer of England. I think in another age, we might all wish, as we might aspire to greatness, to be noticed by a reigning monarch, but I fancy a few of us would opt to be noticed by King Edward II. Stapleton, as you know, came to a very sticky end when the London mob got hold of him and cut off his head reputedly with a carving knife. What a way to go. And it gives me pause for thought every time I pass his tomb in Exeter Cathedral, not least the cadaverous image which is set below his effigy with the superscription, you will be one day as I am. One day we will indeed all be dust. And given that is the reality, how would you want to be remembered? Stapleton's epitaph includes the statement that he founded a hall in Oxford for the education of poor scholars. He did so by taking some of the tithes of a parish in Cornwall, and in those days Devon and Cornwall were one united Exeter diocese, and by that way forming the college which we know today. And it was a remarkable achievement, one of Mung's many down the ages where the church has it invested in education as it still does today. And Stapleton said that he wanted his scholars to be educated in the way of Jesus Christ, the one who said that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth, and the truth, the truth would set us free. So I wonder what epitaph you aspire to. What do you want written on your grave? How do you want to be remembered? And has your education set you free as a human being? Because if so, you have a lot to be thankful for. Outside uh, the bishop's palace, um, there's an absolutely massive oak tree. And it's unusual because it's semi-evergreen. It's a cross between a cork tree and an English oak. And it was planted there in the 18th century by Thomas Luckham. And sometimes it's called a Luckham oak but more usually it's called an Exeter oak. And there are two of these oak trees in the Bishop's Palace grounds. Now, I don't know whether there is an Exeter oak in the rector's garden of the college, but if not, perhaps there ought to be one as we mark the 700th anniversary of the founding of the college. And the secret of the longevity and the resilience of these particular oak trees, or so I'm told, is its massive root system. And I'm reminded of words of Thomas Traherne, the poet. A Christian is an oak tree flourishing in winter, he said. And as the college goes forward to the next century, my prayer is that it, and indeed all Exonians, may flourish. And if we are to flourish even in our winters, then we need to put down deep spiritual roots because that alone will sustain us. 
In the Bible, the uh, dominant image of heaven isn't of angels playing hearts, but it's of a party, a feast, a banquet. So I'm sure that Walter de Stapleton would totally approve that we're going across now to have a bit of a party to celebrate this great college. But before we do so, would you join me in paying our warm thanks to the rector, Sir Rick Trainer?